Coulomb's law contains the same physics as Gauss's law, which is one of the four Maxwell equations that govern all of electromagnetism. Very, very powerful. So we're, we're now going to cloak, um, clothe the principles we've talked about with a little bit more mathematics. So uh, this, these next four lecture segments uh, actually put, put the, the, the screws to the, to the mathematics so we can understand uh, a little bit more quantitatively rather than qualitatively. So we'll, we'll write down Coombs Law and then we'll also introduce a concept called the free the primitivity of free space, which is responsible for uh, a lot of electromagnetic uh, phenomena. All right, let's state Coulomb's law. For those of you that uh, have had, well, I imagine all of you have, but some of you may remember from um, first semester physics that, that Newton's universal law of gravitation had the form that the force between two masses was uh, proportional to the two masses. There was a constant out in front, capital G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and then divided by R squared. So as you increase the distance between those two masses, you decrease the force between them. Coulomb's law has a very similar form. And this is it. The force between two charges, the magnitude of that force. We're not gonna worry about direction now, because we already know about direction. Uh, if you have two positive charges, they repel. If you have a positive and a negative, they attract, etc. So we're now just worried about the magnitude of the force. That's a constant called the Coulomb force constant, and its value is 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. So, uh, and you say, well, wow, am I supposed to memorize that? And I'm saying, yeah. Um, Here's a really easy way to remember it. It's 9 times 10 to the 9, approximately. This number is very, very close to 9. This number is 9. And then the units have to be whatever they have to be to make this equation work out. Let's make sure those units do work out correctly. If we put in um, uh, K, so the force should be measured in Newtons. So if we put in Newtons for force, if we put in K, its units are Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. So that's the units of K here. The units of charge one. Charge is measured in units of coulombs, like we talked about before. So that's the units of this guy. Then the units of this guy are also coulombs. And then this R is the distance between the charges measured in meters. And that is squared. So the meters squared cancel, the coulomb squared cancel these two coulombs, and we get newtons equals newtons, which verify that the units are correct. So k is 9 times 10 to the 9, and if you want to get technical, it's actually 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per coulomb squared. It's called the Coulomb force constant. Q1 is the magnitude, so I've got absolute value signs here to denote the absolute value of the charge, because charges can be both positive and negative. With Newton's universal law of gravitation, we only had positive masses. We didn't have any antimatter going on. There was always an attractive force, um, which is interesting. With gravity, if you have two like masses, meaning both positive, they actually attract instead of repel in the case of having two like charges that repel. So that's why there was a minus sign out in front here for Newton's universal law of gravitation. So this is charge one, it's uh, how much ever charge, these, are, these charges are considered to be point particles, point charges. Charge two, and then the distance between the charges. That's, uh, that's Coulomb's law. So F is Q, or sorry, F is K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Bingo, that's all there is to it. Um, so if we had, for example, charge Q1 and, and Q2, the first one being positive, the second one being negative, then the force of Q2 on Q1, the direction of that force is given by this arrow here. It'll, this, this negative charge will attract the positive charge, pulling it toward it. But the positive charge exerts an equal and opposite 
force on the negative charge. So if we're asking what is the force of this positive charge on this negative charge, then we're going to have to have a force that's in this direction attracting the negative charge to the positive charge. These forces are equal and opposite through Newton's third law, action and reaction pairs. Um, same thing happens if you have two positive charges or two negative charges. Uh, this charge Q1 exerts a repulsive force on this positive charge Q2, pushing Q2 away from it with a force F that's given by Coulomb's law. Same thing here. The magnitude of the force in this case is given by Newton's, uh, by Coulomb's law. Magnitude of the force here is given by Coulomb's law. Um, equal and opposite force here. So um, that's Coulomb's law. And then just one more concept for this section is to write the permittivity of free space in terms of the Coulomb force constant. Well, there's a Coulomb force constant, K. And um, we're just, this is just a definition. Of, it's called epsilon naught. That's a Greek letter, epsilon, and subscript zero. It's one over four pi K. This constant will come in handy later on in this chapter as well as in subsequent chapters. They're just two different constants. I'm not asking you to actually memorize this constant. You can if you want. It's uh, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, with the units that are just inverted from, from this. But I always just remember K and then if I ever need uh, epsilon naught then I remember that epsilon naught is defined as 1 over 4 pi K. So they're just constants of nature. Uh, three charges along a line. So let's suppose we have a uh, negative charge Q2. So its charge Q2 is minus 4 micro coulomb. So let's remind ourselves what a micro is. So Q2 is minus 4 micro coulomb. What's a micro? Micros 10 to the minus 6 is 1 millionth. So that's a micro with the Greek letter mu, M U. So that is that one. This one's minus 7 microcoulombs. And so what we're interested in is the direction of the net force on the charge Q1 that's sitting in the middle. We have distance between Q1 and Q3, it's 0.15 meters. We have the distance between Q1 and Q2, it's 0.2 meters. And we want the net force on Q1. Well, how do we go about finding it? There will be a force of, and if we want the net force on Q1, remember that when we're thinking about Newton's uh, second law, we have to identify the object that we're interested in and then look at all the forces on that particular object. The object we're interested in is Q1. What are the objects that are creating forces on Q1? Well, Q3 exerts a force on Q1. What's the direction of that force? To find that out, you have to say, okay, Q3, is it positive or negative? Well, negative. Q1, is it positive or negative? It's positive. So these two are going to attract each other. And so the force that Q3 exerts on Q1 has to be in this direction, attractive. That's the force of Q3 pulling Q1 toward it, attracting it. Well, what about these guys over here? There's another force acting on Q1, and it's the force due to Q2. Well, Q2 is negative, Q1 is positive, same deal here. Uh, Q2 is going to attract Q1 to it. And so we're going to call this F12. That's the force of Q2 attracting Q1 toward it. All right, and that's shown down here. F12 and F13. Well, now how do we find the magnitudes of these two forces? Easy, because we know Coulomb's law. F12 will involve K, that's 9 times 10 to the 9, easy. Q1, 
Now remember, these are the absolute values of Q1 and Q2. So the absolute value of Q1 is 3 microcoulombs, 3 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. And then the absolute value of Q2 is 4 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. Absolute value removes the minus sign. Divided by the distance squared. So we plug those numbers in, we get 2.7 newtons. Do the same thing for uh, the force between 1 and 3. And in this case, we're using um, Q1 again, and now in this case, Q3, and then the distance between them. And that gives an 8.4 newton force. So F13, consistent with this diagram, is bigger than F12. F13 being 8.4 newtons and F12 being 2.7. So how do we find the net force? If we think of this as the plus x direction and we want to know what the net force in the x direction is, then we'll need the components of these two forces in the x direction. The net force in the x direction is the component of F13, this one, in the x direction. Well, F13 is in the x direction, so its component in the x direction must be positive. So we'll put that 8.4 newtons in as a positive number. F12, the component of this force in the x direction, is negative because it's pointing in the minus x direction. So that's why I have a minus sign here, and there's the 2.7 newtons. So the net force is in the plus x direction, and it's 5.7 newtons. That's how you do these problems. Let's take a look at these uh, two charges shown in the drawing. Uh, which of the following statements correctly describes the direction of the electric force acting on the two charges? Um, well, this one's negative, this one's positive. What's the direction of the force of Q2 on Q1? You say, well, it's attractive. And I say, yeah, you're right. And what about the force of Q1 on Q2? And you say, well, huh, it's attractive again. And I say, right again. So they both attract each other. So let's see which answer is right. The force on Q1 points to the left, and the force on Q2 points to the left. Not true. Force on Q1 points to the right. This is to the right. The force on Q2 points to the left, and that's, in fact, the answer. Q1 to the left. OK. Simple problem. Um, now, which of the following statements correctly describes the magnitude of the electric force acting on the two charges? All right, we've got, it's the same exact problem. <laughs> this one's negative, this one's positive. We got a force, the, the force of Q2 on Q1 pulls Q1 toward Q2. The force of Q1 on Q2 pulls Q2 toward Q1. They're attractive because they're opposite sign charges. But now it's asking about the magnitude of the electric force acting between the two charges. And you might say, well, OK, this charge is bigger than that one, so it should exert a bigger force. And so we might be inclined to think that this would be the right answer. But in fact, that answer is wrong. And I will let you think about this for, I'll give you 10 seconds to think about why that answer is wrong. All right, you've thought about it, you've thought of the answer, good for you. <laughs> um, the answer is the force on Q2 has the same magnitude as the force on, or Q, force on Q1 has the same magnitude as the force on Q2. You say, well, okay, and, and the reason is Newton's third law. We talked about that before with the diagram a couple of slides ago that the force of this one on this one equals the force of this one on that one again. It's the action-reaction pairs. If you're talking about the same force and the same two objects, the force of one, the electric force, the Coulomb's law of Q1 on Q2 is equal and opposite to the force of Q2 back on Q1. So that's just Newton's third law. 
All right, here's a more complicated example, and I'm just going to sketch this one for you. You can uh, do the details if you'd like um, yourself. We've got three charges now, Q1, Q2, and Q3, but we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> They're not all along a straight line. So things get a little bit more exciting, shall we say. Um, and we're interested actually in the force on Q1. Again, we're interested in the force on Q1. But now we have uh, three charges that are not in a line with each other. Here's Q3, it's negative. Here's Q1, it's positive. So we're interested again in, in charge Q1. So what is the direction of the force of Q3, a negative charge, on Q1, positive charge? You say one's negative, one's positive, that's attractive. That means that the force has to be in this direction, F13. All right, so what about now here? We've got Q2, we want to know the direction of the force of Q2 on Q1. Well, Q2 is negative. Q1 is positive. They're unlike charges, they attract. And so Q2 is going to exert a force on Q1 toward it, to attract Q1 toward it. So those are the two forces, and they're both shown here. F12, F13. We can work out the magnitudes of these two forces in exactly the same way that we did in the previous example. We just plug in the distances. These, these just involve the, the straight distances between them. For F12, we need that distance between them. We don't need to do any trigonometry at all to find the magnitude of that force. Same thing here. It's um, the distance, the actual distance between Q1 and Q3 that goes in here. You plug the charges in, you get those two numbers. But now, to find the net force F, we're going to have to add these two vector forces up to each other. And this is a vector relationship that the net force F is the vector sum of the two vectors, F12 and F13. And to add those two vectors, we're going to have to add components, like we learned, learned last semester. So we're going to have to try and find the x and y components of F. So this is the x component of f from here to here, and this is the y component of f. And how do we find it? Well, we just have to resolve and find the components of f13 and f12 in the x and the y directions. So here's the x component. And to do this one, we need the x component of f12. Well, here's F12 right here. It's at a 73 degree angle from the X axis. And if we want the X component, here's the X axis, here's the Y axis. If we want the X component of F12, then I want this piece right here of that right triangle. And that right triangle has a hypotenuse that's equal to F12, the magnitude of the force. And the x component, F12x, is going to be equal to the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle. Why? Because the cosine of this angle, 73, is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. And the adjacent side is what I'm interested in. The hypotenuse is F12. So that multiplying both sides of that equation by F12, you get that the x component of F12 is F12 cosine 73. So that's, that's why this uh, term looks like that. F13, <coughs> uh, what's its component in the x direction? Well, here's F F13. It's all pointed in the x direction. So its x component is just its magnitude. And so we plug the numbers that we have here for F12, the magnitudes of F12, uh, F12 and F13, and we get the x component. The y component is similar. Um, the y component of F12 
is this piece right here, F12 sine 73 instead of cosine 73, plus the y component of F13, zero, because it's pointing only in the x direction. Plug in the numbers, you get this. So to find the final uh, magnitude and direction of the net force, we're going to have to use a Pythagorean theorem. Uh, here's F, here's Fx along here, here's Fy, and F is the hypotenuse of that triangle, squared equals the sum of the squares of, um, of the two sides, Fx squared plus Fy squared uh, equals 23 newtons. And then to find the angle, take the inverse tangent. Turns out to be 24 degrees. That's how you do problems like that.